Monday on our travel day here. Uh, we are in Cooperstown, North Dakota, visiting the Ronald Reagan Minuteman Missile Historical Site. Check her out. It was originally the garage in that late eight effort to boost morale. And I did have a civilian electrician who wired six of these at that time. Working in this area, they had a military escort. Working in the security control center, they had an armed guard on them at all times. There's a red light up on the ceiling. They're also in the security bedrooms and the restrooms. They would have sounded to call out the security teams if needed. This area originally held the ping pong table and the pool table. There was no wall here. It went straight into the dining area. So they made this more cozy. There are several TVs on this level and one down below. The chef served the four meals a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mids. Mids was served 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night, mainly for the night security team getting ready to go out on duty. There were three extra bedrooms here to house any additional personnel who may have been coming in at any time. The chef would have fed those people as well. Often it was a full house here. Okay, this is the kitchen. Cool. Yeah, my way. Towers of communication in both aisles. These are what created all the heat. These towers are for digital, telephone, radio, and that underground cable system. There is a cooling duct going into each one. This is the air handling system over here. There's a weight posted on every drawer that had contents. 40 pounds was the weight limit for one person. These are all two-person lift. Missileer would call up to the controller who would send the other two on the security team out. They had a checklist. Usually it looked fine when they got there, but they had to spend about half an hour checking it anyway. The biggest culprits, rabbits, raccoons, and deer. Could have been somebody parking out on the approach. Could have been somebody working close by in the field. Could have been weather related, like torrential rain or hail. Swirling snow. <coughs> Next row up is called the fault row. A red light there would indicate a mechanical problem. They'd get a printout in code. If, um, all five flights within a squadron would have received an identical order. That's when missileers would have opened the red box. They would have compared things in the order to things in the codes. They had to be sure it was a true order to launch. It took two of the five sites in a squadron working together to launch. One site couldn't launch anything on its own. This is where the launch code would have been entered. The enabling switch, each console had a keyhole. The commander would have done a countdown. 
Whichever of the five sites turned keys first sent the first bolt to launch. Whichever site turned second sent the second bolt. It was the second bolt that triggered the final countdown. They could have launched one or all 50 missiles in the squadron. The warheads were pre-targeted. It was all ready to go. They would have hit their targets in about half an hour. Gated process. Later years, the commander could punch new codes into that keyboard and retarget right from here if they got the order to do so. You forgot to duck. Okay, we have stopped at one of the missile sites here. I think the only one that we can visit here at uh, November 33, N33 was the number of this missile and uh, we're going to go in there and see what they got. I'm sure the warhead's been removed from it. Well, there's nothing to really see here except that it was a missile site where they had a missile on the ground. I'm assuming it might have been. That might have opened up and the missile come out. But they, most of these old sites, they have filled, exploded them, in, imploded them, and filled them with concrete. So, uh, for security, after they uh, disarmed them. Okay, uh, the round uh, cover I said for that's not where the missile would come out. This would be, yeah, much larger, and uh, it would slide open here. It would slide back to allow them to fire the missile here. I thought I was hoping it'd be open, you know, with the warhead removed so you can see it, but right now it's not. <laughs> Had to park way down there. You could turn a single vehicle down here, but we're dragging the camper. We had to park down beside the road. Okay, let's go home. Oh. No, we're not going home yet. We're, we're going to the tall. <clears throat> we're going to the tall uh, mass, tall TV station mass. That's but the tallest structure in the eastern hemisphere or something out of here. It used to be the tallest in the world. We're going to find out next. We are seven miles away from this uh, television station uh, antenna st structure here in Gallagher, North Dakota. So we've been looking at this thing since we was 20 miles away from it. This television mask, let's get the base out. This television mask here in Gatslin, North Dakota, I believe it is called, is the tallest structure in the Eastern Hemisphere. It used to be the tallest in the world, but uh, another country beat, beat, beat them out. In 1968, I'm hearing on the internet, a Marine Corps helicopter ran through the guide wires here, killed all four crew members aboard, and the tower fell at that time in 1968. Sometime in the 70s, some someone I climbed to the top of it and reported, you know, you could feel it like waving in the wind as he's climbing up, but did it safely. I'm not sure what the penalty for doing that was, but this was an interesting thing. Been on my list for a while, so we came by this way to see it.
We are in Bemidji, Minnesota. The Paul Bunyan and Blue as Ox is, was on my list. But we're here at a day when they are having the Dragon Boat Festival. And they have a, I see a Dragon Boat 4K race and some other things. So we're checking this out in the town of Bemidji, Minnesota. Okay, anyway, this Paul Bunyan babe statue has been on my list. But I've seen better. I, I think the first one I saw was out in California. It seemed to be a lot taller, a lot better. But uh, I have to look at the pictures and see. In the visitor center here, there are a lot of large things. There's a fishing rod. There's a big fishing lure on it. Here is a walking stick. I'm going to zoom out to catch most of it. There's a walking stick propped up by the fireway. Look at this phone. That thing's so big. I got dice on the floor. I don't know if that's a bobber or what. Um, there's a walk, but it's not really oversized. But, uh, Axe, probably Paul Bain's axe, fishing lures. You know, I've seen nets that big. But look at this shotgun. That is one large shotgun. And uh, of course, a bay box kids can ride on. <clears throat> Locked on a crawl through, and Paul Bunny can sit alongside him. And uh, there's a big broom. Of the bathroom doors. Okay, now I'm just assigning a super large guest book. Right big. <laughs> sit, sit at the back marker. <clears throat> yep, get our signature. You got our signature in there. Okay, here in Bemidji, Minnesota, we also have Lake Bemidji, which is a very large lake. And it's also part of the, I don't know if it's part of it, but the Mississippi River flows through it. It's going to come in under the bridge over here, which is probably the first place that it crosses a uh, four-lane highway. It's going to come in over there, and then it continues somewhere over there. We're now in Meminja, Minnesota, and guess what? I found my angel still here with me. How cool is that? Okay, the last time I saw this fellow was in Stillwater, Missouri. Here he is up in Meminja, Minnesota. Linus. Up here he's working as a guide. Way to go, Linus. Okay, well this statue is definitely made better than Paul Bunyan's statue across the street here. Uh, don't know the name of the Indians got his head up as in Hollywood they'd be saying how. But uh, yeah, he definitely looks like a real human. But I guess they put him up here and then planted a tree afterwards so you can't even see him. Not even up close here hardly. Okay, I forget how I learned about this place, but it's been on my list for a while, and today we're checking it off. <laughs> so those blasted things. It's like a rock store, I believe, here in Laverne, Minnesota, just just barely in Minnesota before you get out in North uh, 
It's in southwest Minnesota here. You check it out. Anyway, they have a little store here. I'm going to kind of do a walkthrough, etc. Okay, well, I didn't film inside. They have a lot of, a lot of nice little rocks and stuff from all over the place, I reckon. Uh, mm -hmm. If a person collected rocks, that'd be great. Uh, stones, but I don't, so I didn't get anything. But it, it was on our way. It was not out of our way a bit to stop by here. On to the, we're headed to the tri-corner of Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. Okay, I like these tri-state markers when they take the time and build a monument to it. Uh, this is Tri-State Marker of Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. I'm on a, I guess, well, I'm standing in Iowa right now. And, oh, it's got a, uh, okay, anyway, Iowa, Minnesota, no, this would be Minnesota over here. I'm in Minnesota, nothing is going to keep going, nothing. And then, in this other state.